Section 138 of United States Senate Election, Expulsion, and Censure Cases, 1793-1990, to by Anne M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Case 136, Richard L. Raudebusch, 1918-1995, to versus R. Vance Hartke, 1919-to present, Indiana. Election case, November 17, 1970, to July 24, 1972. Issues. Contested election, Indiana recount of ballots. Chronology. Request for recount, November 17, 1970. Hart key seated, January 21, 1971. Supreme Court decision, February 23, 1972. Recount completed July 24, 1972. Result, Hartke retained seat. Background. In 1970, Democrat R. Vance Hartke of Indiana received his party's nomination for a third term in the United States Senate. His Republican opponent was five-term Representative Richard Raudebusch. Raudebush had agreed to President Richard M. Nixon's request that he give up a safe House seat to challenge Hartke, a persistent critic of the administration's Vietnam War policies. The ensuing race was described as one of the most acrimonious and bitterly fought Senate campaigns in recent American history. Raudebush attempted to portray his opponent as sympathetic to communist countries in general, and North Vietnam in particular. He condemned Hartke's acceptance of a $30,000 campaign contribution from a Chicago mail-order firm shortly before his appointment to the Senate Post Office and Civil Service Committee. Hartke, for his part, attacked the administration's military and economic policies and his supporters suggested that Raudebush had not fully recovered from a head injury suffered in a plane crash two years earlier. On Election Day, Hartke received a slim plurality of 4,500 votes out of 1.7 million votes cast. Statement of the Case Richard Raudebush exercised his right under Indiana law to demand a recount claiming irregularities in 11 counties. Vance Hartke successfully blocked his opponent's petition before a United States district court based on the argument that a recount would interfere with the Senate's constitutional right to judge the elections and qualifications of its members. Raudebush appealed this decision to the United States Supreme Court, Pending this appeal, the Senate seated Hartke on January 21, 1971, without prejudice to the outcome of the court case. Hartke then moved to dismiss Raudebush's appeal as moot, a claim that the Supreme Court rejected. Conclusion A year passed before the Supreme Court ruled on February 24, 1972. In the case of Raudebush v. Hartke, 495 U.S. 15, the court decided that Indiana officials were within their rights to conduct a recount, but that the Senate was not bound by the results and could arrive at an independent determination. The subsequent recount reduced Hartke's plurality by only 48 votes, and on June 12, 1972, Raudebush acted to terminate the recount. On July 24, Howard W. Cannon, Democrat of Nevada, chairman of the Senate Subcommittee on Privileges and Elections, announced that Vance Hartke is the duly elected senator from the state of Indiana and is entitled, without reservation or qualification, to his seat in the Senate. In 1971, President Nixon had appointed Raudebush to a high-ranking post in the Veterans Administration. In 1974, 
President Gerald R. Ford nominated him as that agency's administrator. The Senate Committee on Veterans Affairs, chaired by Vance Hartke, recommended confirmation, which occurred on October 1, 1974. Rauderbusch served in that position until the start of the Carter administration in 1977. He died in 1995. Hartke lost his 1976 re-election bid to Republican Richard Lugar. End of Case 136, End of Section 138. Section 139 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793-1990, by Ann M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Case 137, John A. Durkin, 1936 to present, versus Louis C. Wyman, 1917 to present, New Hampshire. Election case, December 27, 1974, to July 30, 1975. Issues, contested election, recount of disputed ballots. Chronology. Petition of contest filed December 27, 1974. Referred to committee December 30, 1974. Committee report January 13, 1974. Referred back to committee January 28, 1975. Committee report May 22, 1975. Senate vote July 30, 1975. Result, seat declared vacant, new election held. Background. In 1973, Norris H. Cottons, Republican of New Hampshire, announcement of his plans to retire from the Senate the next year, thrust New Hampshire politicians into a vigorous contest for the seat. The fall campaign of 1974 pitted the youthful Democrat John A. Durkin who had served as the state's insurance commissioner, against the conservative, widely known Republican representative Louis C. Wyman. With a solid record of public service and good political connections, Wyman anticipated an easy victory in his traditionally Republican state. Surprisingly, on November 5th, the expected Republican landslide failed to materialize as Wyman's lead dwindled to a mere 355 votes out of more than 200,000 cast. Durkin charged voting irregularities, demanded a recount, and declared, It's still a horse race. On November 27, after completing the recount, the Secretary of State named John Durkin the winner by 10 votes and the governor issued him a conditional certificate of election. Louis Wyman promptly appealed to the New Hampshire State Ballot Law Commission, a move Durkin tried to check by legal maneuvers that eventually involved all levels of the New Hampshire courts. Durkin's attorney also sought an injunction in federal court to send the matter directly to the U.S. Senate, but on December 18, the federal district court denied the request. The ballot commission therefore conducted its own partial recount and announced on December 24 that Wyman was the victor by two votes. Republican Governor Meldrum Thompson, Jr. therefore issued a certificate of election to Louis Wyman on December 27th and rescinded Durkin's credentials, explaining that he had issued them prematurely. Wyman himself, however, still urged a new election as the best solution. With Durkin stripped of his credentials and a distressed public calling for a new election, it became increasingly clear that the stalemate would be taken to the United States Senate for resolution. Statement of the case. Based on the constitutional provision that each House of Congress is the final arbiter of its elections, 
John Durkin, on December 27, 1974, filed a petition of contest with the U.S. Senate, which referred the matter to the Rules and Administration Committee's Subcommittee on Privileges and Elections. Durkin challenged Wyman's right to the seat and defended the validity of the first recount. On January 5, 1975, Wyman filed a response requesting that the Durkin challenge be dismissed and that he be seated. Meanwhile, because Norris Cotton had resigned, effective December 31st, Governor Thompson appointed Wyman to fill the vacancy for the last few days of Cotton's term. Wyman thus became a senator for that brief period, although Congress was not in session at the time. The subcommittee began by holding a hearing, but after a day of acrimonious testimony, passed the matter to the full committee on rules and administration. When the full committee, made up of five Democrats and three Republicans, considered the matter on January 13th, it deadlocked four to four, first on a motion to seat Wyman without prejudice, and then on one to ask both Durkin and Wyman to stand aside, pending a review of the case. Democrat James Allen of Alabama, who believed strongly that Wyman should be seated provisionally because he presented valid credentials, voted with the Republicans both times to create the deadlock. The committee then unanimously decided that the contest should be brought before the full Senate. Response of the Senate When the Senate of the 94th Congress convened on January 14, 1975, with Democrats holding an overwhelming majority, John Durkin and Louis Wyman sat at separate tables at the back of the chamber as they listened to a floor debate rooted in party divisions. Pointing out that the New Hampshire courts had sustained the recall of Durkin's credentials, Republicans insisted that, since only Wyman possessed legitimate credentials issued by the governor, he should be seated without prejudice while the Rules Committee considered the matter. In the other contested election case facing the Senate at this time, they observed the body did in fact seat Henry Bellman, Republican of Oklahoma, while referring the issue to the Rules Committee, see Case 138. Democrats retorted that although there were no allegations of fraud against Wyman, there were charges of error in the recount and there was ample precedent for asking both claimants to step aside. Under existing New Hampshire law, a new election could only be held in the case of a tie. And on January 6, 1975, the Supreme Court of New Hampshire had ruled that the state courts were not empowered to review a contested federal election. Since Durkin had exhausted the New Hampshire state procedures, it was now up to the U.S. Senate to resolve the conflict. Action was postponed for two weeks after both sides agreed to delay a vote on the issue until January 28. In the meantime, the New Hampshire legislature, on January 22, adopted a measure providing for a new election if the Senate declared that a vacancy existed and Governor Thompson himself carried the new state law to Washington. Wyman then asked the Senate to rule the New Hampshire seat vacant so that state officials would be free to order the new election. When January 28th arrived, however, the Senate, with Democrats voting in the majority, first refused either to seat Wyman provisionally or to declare the seat vacant and then voted 58 to 34 to send the disputed New Hampshire election back to the Rules Committee. As James Allen complained on the Senate floor, refusing to seat a duly certified senator-elect was contrary to Senate precedent, 
in cases where there were no allegations of fraud. This is a matter that should not be decided on the basis of party lines, he declared. After an additional three weeks of discussion, the Rules Committee on February 19th agreed to a procedure for recounting 3,500 disputed ballots. In attempting to weed out those that were not clearly controversial, the eight senators depended on a complicated system of, wherever possible, masking candidates' names and party affiliations on the ballots as they sought to interpret the confusing marks made by some voters. A special three-member auditing panel, consisting of the Democratic and Republican subcommittee councils and Senate Parliamentarian Emeritus Dr. Floyd M. Riddick, was to review any remaining disputed ballots. The committee adopted rules requiring this panel to reach unanimous agreement on any questioned ballot or return it to the Rules Committee for another evaluation. The ballots were brought from New Hampshire to Washington, where they were kept under guard, and the review continued from February through April. The carefully devised process turned out to contain so many opportunities for irreconcilable partisan conflicts, however, that the committee experienced a succession of tie votes on enough contested ballots to affect the outcome of the election. When the frustrated committee members realized in mid-May that they would be unable to agree upon which person to seat, they decided simply to go ahead and file a report. An accompanying resolution placed before the full Senate the questions the committee was unable to resolve as well as the disputed ballots on which the committee held tie votes. Having spent over 200 hours on the case, the Rules and Administration Committee had already established a new record for the time devoted to deliberating on a single subject. Then, beginning on June 11th, the full Senate proceeded to discuss the case for more than six weeks with Wyman and Durkin and their attorneys again observing in the back of the chamber. As a few Southern Democrats joined with the minority Republicans to ensure that the Democrats would not achieve the 60 votes needed to end debate, the Senate, over a period of several weeks in June and early July, took an unprecedented six cloture votes on the subject, none of which succeeded. Durkin continued to hold out for a Senate solution, even amid Republican taunts that he dared not face a second election, and his party colleagues supported him. With each passing day, however, senators devoted less and less time to the New Hampshire dispute, turning their attention to other topics as members of both parties recognized they were incapable of reaching a solution. By July 28th, the Senate had actually resolved only one of the 35 disputed points referred to it by the Rules Committee. Yet neither faction appeared willing to compromise. As the August recess approached, the Senate remained hopelessly deadlocked. On July 28th, the Washington Post ran an editorial charging that it would be incredible if the Senate were to go on vacation for a month without settling the New Hampshire Senate election case. The newspaper suggested that Wyman and Durkin should try to reach some agreement to settle the matter. Following up on the suggestion, Louis Wyman wrote to Durkin that day urging him to support a new election. Durkin initially refused, but then on July 29th, reversed his earlier position and announced to a New Hampshire television audience his intention to agree to a new election. 
The next morning, July 30th, he reported this change to the Democratic leadership, thus relieving the Senate from further deliberations on the topic. Later that same day, the Senate voted 71 to 21 to declare the seat vacant as of August 8th. New Hampshire then arranged to hold a special election on September 16, 1975. Conclusion In a record-breaking turnout for a special election, New Hampshire voters gave Democrat John Durkin a convincing victory by a margin of more than 27,000 votes. As it happened, Norris Cotton, the innocent initiator of the events, administered the oath of office to Durkin. Once the Senate had declared the seat vacant, the New Hampshire governor had appointed Cotton to fill the vacancy, and he served from August 8th to September 18, 1975. In December 1975, the Senate agreed to reimburse Durkin and Wyman for a combined total of $227,000 in legal fees and to pay each of them $150 a day for the period from January to August 1975. The New Hampshire contest, the closest election in Senate history, had captured the attention of the national press. Citizens of New Hampshire were embarrassed by the flood of publicity, some of it very unfavorable. Weary of a dispute, marred by vicious personal slurs, and disturbed that the state had been left with only one senator for more than seven months, they wanted an end to the controversy. In fact, on July 30th, the governor and council of New Hampshire adopted a resolution that was immediately transmitted to Washington, threatening that If the Senate went on vacation without resolving the matter, the state attorney general should go to court to have senators' salaries withheld. As had been the case with so many of the contested elections handled by the Senate, the body was unable to avoid partisanship in its review and deliberations. Once the dispute reached the Senate floor, Republicans— fearing the Democrats planned to use their overwhelming numbers to declare Durkin the winner, managed to hold solidly together on vote after vote. They were joined on cloture votes by enough Southern Democrats to prevent the Senate from acting. The strategy did succeed in blocking action, but when combined with the Democrats' equally staunch support of Durkin, It led to a seven-month process that left the Senate appearing partisan, confused, and ineffectual to the American public. End of Case 137 and of Section 139. Section 140 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases 1793-1990, to by Ann M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Case 138, Edmund A. Edmondson, 1919 to present, versus Henry L. Bellman, 1921 to present, Oklahoma. Election case, January 9, 1975, to March 4, 1976. Issues, Campaign Irregularities. Chronology. Petition filed January 9, 1975. Referred to committee January 14, 1975. Committee report January 27, 1976. Senate vote March 4, 1976. Result, Bellman retained seat. Background. Former Oklahoma Governor Henry L. Bellman, Republican, first won election to the United States Senate in 1968. When Bellman ran for re-election six years later, he was challenged by Democrat Edmund A. Edmondson, who had served for 20 years in the House of Representatives. On November 5, 1974, 
Incumbent Henry Bellman defeated Ed Edmondson by 3,835 votes. Edmondson challenged the results on the ground that there had been improprieties in regard to the voting machines in Tulsa County. The Oklahoma Supreme Court ruled 9-0 to zero on December 19, 1974, that although the irregularities occurred, Edmondson had not demonstrated that they had had an impact on the outcome of the election. Once the court challenge was decided, the state went ahead and issued a certificate of election to Bellman. Statement of the case. Unwilling to drop his challenge, Ed Edmondson filed a petition with the U.S. Senate on January 9, 1975. He charged violations of the laws of the state of Oklahoma and asked the Senate to accept jurisdiction over the contest. Four days later, on January 13, Henry Bellman filed a response to the Edmondson petition, together with a motion to dismiss. That same day, the Committee on Rules and Administration considered the petition, the motion, and the answer, and unanimously recommended to the Senate that Henry Bellman be seated without prejudice to Edmondson's contest of the election. When the 94th Congress convened on January 14, 1975, the Senate seated Bellman without prejudice and referred the matter to the Committee on Rules and Administration. Edmondson's petition and complaint challenged the voting results in Tulsa County and alleged that the following violations occurred. 1. The United States Senate contest was listed on the ballot after the state races, rather than before them, as state law required. 2. The voting machines lacked devices for straight party voting, again contrary to law. 3. 545 of the 640 machines used in Tulsa County prominently displayed erroneous and misleading instructions as to straight party voting, even though it was not possible on those machines. Edmondson contended that where the master Democratic Party lever was missing from a voting machine, many voters had pulled the lever for the Democratic candidate for the U.S. House of Representatives, thinking it was the lever for all Democratic candidates. He pointed out that in Tulsa County, Bellman had won by 22,000 votes, while in the remaining counties, Edmondson had led by 18,000 votes. Response of the Senate The Subcommittee on Privileges and Elections discussed the case on June 3rd and then postponed further consideration until after it resolved the John Durkin-Louis Wyman election contest. It completed that matter in the summer of 1975 by declaring the New Hampshire seat vacant and calling for a new election, see Case 137. Following a staff investigation in Oklahoma in August and October 1975, the committee held hearings on the Edmondson Bellman case in November and December, obtaining new evidence that had not been presented to the Oklahoma Supreme Court. After reviewing this additional data, Expert witnesses testifying on Edmondson's behalf asserted that, but for the violations of the law, there was a high probability that Mr. Edmondson would have received sufficient votes in Tulsa County to win in the statewide election. On December 15, 1975, the Rules and Administration Committee members voted five to three along party lines, with Democrats in the majority, that they were unable to identify a winner in the disputed election. The committee therefore referred the final determination to the Senate, which could, if necessary,
declare a vacancy and call a special election. Republican members of the committee complained about the party-line nature of the vote, and Bellman's Oklahoma colleague, Dewey F. Bartlett, Republican, contrasted the Senate's action with the case of Dennis Chavez and Patrick Hurley in 1954, see case 132. In that instance, he declared, the Senate, then under Republican control, refused to disenfranchise New Mexico voters simply because of the failings of election officials. On January 27, 1976, the Rules and Administration Committee presented its report on the case to the Senate. The majority report found that irregularities and violations of Oklahoma law had occurred that could have affected the outcome of the election because the statutes violated were substantive in nature, affecting the franchise. The form of the irregularities made it impossible for the committee to determine who would have won the election had the violations of law not occurred. A minority report agreed with the Oklahoma Supreme Court ruling that Henry Bellman had won the election. The three Republican senators rejected Edmondson's contention that many Tulsa County voters failed to vote in the U.S. Senate race due to confusion over the misleading instructions. They pointed out that, in fact, 97% of those who voted in that county did vote in the Senate race, a higher percentage than in any other county. Charging that the majority report was a partisan document, the minority recommended that Edmondson's challenge to the election be dismissed because Bellman had been duly elected by the voters of Oklahoma. When the Senate began considering the resolution submitted by the majority on March 1st, it granted Edmondson the privilege of the floor for the occasion and permitted attorneys for both parties to sit at tables in the rear of the chamber. The body also allowed the use of visual aids in the case, and two voting machines from Tulsa were brought to the floor for a demonstration, one with and one without, the misleading instructions for straight party voting. During the debate, Bellman spoke once, asserting that the Senate would set a bad precedent if it declared the seat vacant, since there were no charges of misconduct against either candidate, and Edmondson had not requested a recount. It was simply a close election, he contended, and throwing out the results, could lead the losers of all close elections to appeal to the Senate. The debate continued until March 4th, when the Senate finally voted, 47 to 46, to table the majority's resolution. Nine Democrats joined all Senate Republicans in voting to end the challenge against Bellman, who had energetically lobbied his colleagues for their support. By voice vote, the Senate then agreed that Henry Bellman should retain his seat. Conclusion Henry Bellman remained in the Senate until 1981. In 1986, he was once again elected governor of Oklahoma. Ed Edmondson tried for the Senate again in 1978, but failed to win nomination. End of Case 138 and of Section 140 Section 141 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793-1990, by Ann M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Case 139, Herman E. Talmadge, 1913 to present, Georgia. Censure Case, May 24, 1978, to October 11, 1979. Issues financial misconduct. Chronology. Request for investigation, May 24, 1978. Committee report, October 3, 1979. 
Senate vote October 11, 1979. Result, censured or denounced. Background. In 1978, Herman E. Talmadge, Democrat of Georgia, was an influential and respected senator. Initially elected to the Senate in 1956 as a proponent of states' rights, he had gained national recognition and esteem through his work on the Watergate investigation. Yet, despite Talmadge's political stature, the 1970s were a decade of personal suffering for him. His son had drowned in 1975, and his wife Betty had divorced him two years later. During the litigation over the divorce property settlement, newspaper accounts of the trial revealed a number of financial irregularities by Talmadge. When it became apparent that in five years he had written only $600 in checks for cash, the senator explained that he received most of his pocket money in small amounts of cash from constituents. Betty Talmadge had testified in court that her husband kept large amounts of cash in an overcoat at their home to pay for all household expenses. She also described a large stock transaction that had never been disclosed as required by law. The Senate had changed considerably as an institution during Herman Talmadge's tenure. When he arrived in 1957, there were few laws or rules regulating senatorial conduct. But since the Thomas Dodd censure case in 1967, see Case 135, the pace of reform had quickened. During the 1970s, Congress passed more government reform legislation than at any other time in history. Responding to the Dodd case, the Senate in 1968 adopted standards of conduct and limited financial disclosure requirements for members and some Senate employees. This action was followed by passage of the 1971 Federal Election Campaign Act which required reports on campaign contributions and expenditures and set monetary limits on media advertising. In 1977, the Senate changed the name of the Select Committee on Standards and Conduct to the Select Committee on Ethics and formalized the mechanism for managing serious complaints. The new Ethics Committee then published its rules of procedure for responding to complaints. The multi-stage process consisted of a preliminary inquiry, initial review, and investigation with trial-type hearings. The committee also created procedures for considering specific subjects, such as sensitive materials, or whether there should be media coverage of hearings. If the committee determined that a case warranted the use of outside counsel, it had the authority to hire one. The committee would then report its conclusions and recommendations to the Senate. The Talmadge case was the first conducted by the committee under these procedures. The allegations against Herman Talmadge were the most serious made against a senator since Thomas Dodd's censure by the Senate in 1967. In fact, many of the regulations Talmadge was charged with violating had not existed at the time of the Dodd censure and had been established in response to that case. Statement of the Case Soon after the Select Committee on Ethics learned of the newspaper reports regarding Herman Talmadge, it determined that a preliminary inquiry was needed, in light of additional press accounts, that the senator had accepted excessive reimbursement from the Senate. Then, on May 24, 1978, the senator asked the committee to review his practice of accepting small cash gifts. 
the committee appointed a special counsel, and unanimously agreed that there was sufficient evidence to justify moving to the next stage with an initial review. In response to the newspaper articles alleging that the senator had submitted incorrect vouchers and received overpayments, both Talmadge and the committee conducted audits of his office accounts. Based on the results of the audits, Talmadge repaid the Senate $37,125.90 for excess reimbursements he had received between 1972 and 1978. On December 18, 1978, after studying the special counsel's initial report, the committee voted to conduct a full investigation of five allegations, the third stage of the process. Prior to the hearings, Talmadge filed a number of legal motions. The most significant related to an issue that had not been resolved during the Dodd inquiry, the standard of proof applicable to evidence. Talmadge urged adopting the standard used in criminal cases, that a charge must be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. But the committee determined that it would require only clear and convincing evidence, the same standard used in civil cases. The senator also sought to exclude documents that had been stolen from his office by his former employee, Daniel Minshew, but the committee denied this motion. Public hearings into the charges against Herman Talmadge began on April 30, 1979, and concluded on July 12. Daniel Minshew, the senator's former administrative assistant, who was the subject of a related criminal investigation, became a key committee witness. Although the committee had serious problems with Minshew's credibility, the members believed his testimony could not be totally discounted. Minshew testified that, following the senator's instructions, he had opened a secret account at Riggs Bank in which he had deposited reimbursement checks and campaign contributions. These campaign contributions were not reported as required by law. According to Minshew, proceeds from the account went to Herman Talmadge, his wife, and his son. Minshew himself had received $18,000 from the account, which he claimed was repayment for expenditures he had made on the senator's behalf. The committee members, however, believed that he had taken the money for his personal use. Both Betty Talmadge and Minshew testified that the senator habitually carried $100 bills, but Talmadge could not remember the names of any of the contributors who he claimed provided the small cash donations he used as spending money. Because the committee had determined that the senator's testimony was essential, Talmadge agreed to appear at the hearings and also called his own witnesses. In defending his actions, Herman Talmadge stated that his office had given financial matters a low priority, that he was unaware of the over-reimbursements, and that he had learned of the Riggs account only in 1978. He attacked the veracity of his wife and the former employee. Response of the Senate The committee filed its report with the Senate on October 4, 1979, finding violations or failures of administrative oversight in four areas. Although the report's carefully worded conclusion failed to specify who committed the offenses. Other sections of the report, however, went considerably further in attributing to Talmadge direct knowledge or participation in the misconduct. The committee found evidence of the following wrongdoing. One, between 1973 and 1978, 
the senator had submitted vouchers for and received $43,435 in excess reimbursements. Since the vouchers were signed either by Autopen or by staff members, the committee concluded that the senator had failed properly to supervise their preparation. Two, Talmadge's required financial disclosure reports were inaccurate for the years 1972 to 1977. Three, campaign finance reports mandated by the Federal Election Campaign Act were filed late for 1973, and inaccurate reports were filed in 1974. And four, more than $10,000 in campaign funds were not reported, were deposited by the senator's campaign chairman in a bank account, and were used for non-campaign purposes, in violation of both campaign laws and a Senate rule. Based on these findings, the committee submitted a resolution stating that the senator knew or should have known about these acts and was therefore responsible for them through the gross neglect of his duty to oversee the administration of his office. Because this conduct tended to bring the Senate into dishonor and disrepute, the committee voted unanimously to recommend that Talmadge be denounced and required to reimburse the Senate for any outstanding overpayment. Resolutions addressing misconduct in previous cases had recommended that the Senate censure or condemn a colleague, but Herman Talmadge pressed the committee to use the term reprimand. While not accepting this alternative, the committee explained that it had specifically avoided using the words censure and condemn because the members believed that Talmadge's transgressions were substantially different from those in earlier cases. They therefore chose words that specifically did not depend on analogy to dissimilar historical circumstance for interpretation. The vice chairman of the committee, Harrison Schmidt, Republican of New Mexico, had urged the use of the word censure. Although his motion was defeated, he added his separate views to the report. The Capitol Hill newspaper Roll Call reported that the Senate parliamentarian was confused about the precise meaning of the term denounce, stating, it's not censure and it's not reprimand. Where it falls between the two, I sure don't know. In addition to proposing its resolution, the committee referred a number of possible violations of criminal law to the U.S. Attorney General, but the Department of Justice issued no indictments against Herman Talmadge. The committee further recommended reforms in Senate accounting procedures, including bookkeeping, voucher procedures, use of auto pens to sign vouchers, and internal audits for suspected abuse. The report also suggested that rules be adopted to define official and reimbursable expenses. When the Senate considered the committee's proposed resolution on October 11, 1979, Talmadge was permitted to have his attorney present. After the committee chairman, Adelaide E. Stevenson III, Democrat of Illinois, reported on the investigation, Harrison Schmidt reviewed the evidence and reiterated his arguments that censure was the appropriate term to use in this case of serious misconduct. In all but two previous cases, the Senate had used the word censure. The two exceptions, Hiram Bingham, Case 112, and Joseph McCarthy, Case 133, were condemned by the Senate. But that word, Schmidt noted, seems to have been treated by historians as tantamount to censure. Still, if the Senate adopted the committee's term denounced, he declared, 
the strongest possible meaning should be placed on the punishment. In response to Senators' questions, Chairman Stevenson stressed that the resolution did not attribute knowledge of the wrongdoing to Talmadge, but rather that he knew or should have known. The Senate debate demonstrated that some members still had misgivings about the Ethics Committee's process. Thomas Eagleton, Democrat of Missouri, for example, commented that while the new procedures constituted an improvement, they were very time-consuming and forced committee members to serve as both judge and jury at trial-type hearings. He recommended appointing an independent outsider to conduct the hearings. No amendments were proposed to the resolution, which the Senate debated for only one afternoon and then adopted by a vote of 81 to 15. Herman Talmadge had not contested the resolution, but after it passed, he rose and spoke. Acknowledging that he had been negligent in overseeing his office and campaign finances, he emphasized that neither the committee nor the Senate had found that he had engaged in intentional wrongdoing and that censure had not been sought. While rededicating himself to his fellow senators and to the people of Georgia, Talmadge also stated his intention to continue to serve in the Senate for a number of years to come. When he finished, other senators expressed their friendship and support for him. Conclusion A traditional explanation by scholars and senators for the institutional reluctance to discipline individual members has been that the voters provide the final judgment. Herman Talmadge believed this and, during the investigation, declared that the charges would not affect his re-election. The ultimate ethics committee, he maintained, are the people of Georgia. When Talmadge sought re-election in 1980, however, he faced significant opposition in the state's Democratic primary for the first time in 24 years. Receiving less than 50 percent of the vote, he succeeded in winning a runoff against the state's lieutenant governor. After a fall campaign in which Talmadge's ethical conduct was a significant issue, he was defeated by the Republican candidate, Mac Mattingly. Later, in his memoir, Talmadge wrote that he regretted not having fought for full exoneration on the Senate floor. The Talmadge case exemplifies the evolution of reforms initiated immediately before and after the Dodd case. Thomas Dodd's legal challenges had resolved key issues, establishing the committee's jurisdiction and affirming the general process. In the decade between the Dodd and Talmadge cases, the Ethics Committee was created and a code of conduct adopted, making it possible for the first time to evaluate senators' behavior against clear standards. Perhaps these changes explain the relatively brief Senate floor debate over Talmadge. In the Talmadge case, the committee resolved two other important issues. It established the standard of evidence for its work as comparable to that used in civil rather than criminal cases and set the precedent that, with or without direct knowledge, senators have ultimate responsibility for any wrongdoing related to their public office. End of Case 139, End of Section 141. Section 142 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793 to 1990, by Ann M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Case 140, Harrison A. Williams, Jr., 1919 to present, New Jersey. 
Expulsion Case, May 5, 1981, to March 11, 1982. Issues Convicted of Corruption Chronology Inquiry begun May 5, 1981. Committee Report September 3, 1981. No Senate action. Result resigned before Senate could act. Background In February 1980, press reports linked Harrison A. Williams, Jr., Democrat of New Jersey, to the FBI's ABSCAM sting operation and investigation of business crime and political corruption. Williams, serving in his fourth term and chairman of the Senate Committee on Labor and Human Resources, was indicted on October 30, 1980, on nine counts, including bribery, receipt of an unlawful gratuity, conflict of interest, and conspiracy to defraud the United States. At the trial in the United States District Court in Brooklyn, New York, the FBI produced videotapes of Williams promising to use his influence to aid a supposed Arab sheik, impersonated by an FBI agent, in return for a multi-million dollar loan to a titanium mining corporation in which the senator had a secret financial interest. On May 1, 1981, the jury found Williams guilty on all counts. In other abscam cases, six members of the House of Representatives were also found guilty. One, Michael Ozzie Myers, was expelled, two resigned, and the others were defeated for re-election. Statement of the Case The Senate Select Committee on Ethics commenced a preliminary inquiry of Harrison Williams' abscam involvement after the initial press reports appeared in early 1980. The committee deferred further action, however, so as not to jeopardize either the Department of Justice case or Williams' right to a fair trial free of prejudicial publicity. Once the jury returned a guilty verdict, these reasons for deference were removed, although Williams, who steadfastly insisted that he was innocent, continued to press upon the trial judge his post-trial motions to set aside the jury verdict on grounds of procedural due process. On May 5th, the committee adopted a resolution authorizing an investigation of the senator, the final, most active stage in its multi-stage procedure. It also engaged Robert S. Bennett as special counsel. On July 14, 15, and 28, 1981, the Ethics Committee held hearings at which Williams was represented by counsel and was permitted to call and examine witnesses. While I may have crossed over the line which divides appropriate service to constituents from excessive boasting and posturing, Williams said, I never engaged in any illegal conduct. I never corrupted my office, and I never intended to do anything that would bring dishonor to the Senate. Despite Williams' claims, on August 24th, the Ethics Committee unanimously found his conduct ethically repugnant and recommended his expulsion. In its report issued on September 3rd, the committee concluded, among other things, that he had offered to use his influence to win a government contract and that he intended to conceal his interest in the mining venture. The report declared that these, and Williams' other actions, tended to bring the Senate into dishonor and disrepute, and only the most severe sanction is appropriate for such an abuse of the public trust. In September, Ethics Committee Chairman Malcolm Wallop, Republican of Wyoming, announced to the Senate that debate on the resolution would begin in November. In the meantime, he had arranged for key portions of the video and audio tapes that had been used as evidence in Williams' trial 
to be played in a Senate office building on several occasions so that senators could view the evidence for themselves before voting. Stressing the gravity of the issue, Wallop repeatedly took the floor through the rest of the month and again in November to remind senators of their duty to take the time to review the tapes. The committee report had originally recommended that the full Senate postpone action on the case until after the district court judge ruled on the pending due process motions filed by Williams. On the other hand, the committee members believed it was bad for both the Senate and Williams himself to have Senate action delayed too long. For this reason, debate was first set for November, even though the judge had not yet ruled, then postponed until December 3rd. Meanwhile, on November 23rd, after Senate leaders rejected Williams' request to be represented by private legal counsel on the Senate floor, he filed suit against the Senate in federal court. Williams charged that the Ethics Committee acted unlawfully as investigator, judge, and jury, and that the full Senate threatened to violate his constitutional right to counsel. Although District Judge Gerhard Gazelle refused to issue a temporary restraining order against the Senate expulsion debate, Senate leaders did decide to postpone considering the issue so that Daniel Inoue, Democrat of Hawaii, who had agreed to serve as Williams' chief advocate on the floor, would have time to prepare his case. The debate was therefore rescheduled for January 1982. On December 21, 1981, Federal District Judge George C. Pratt denied Williams' due process motions to dismiss his indictment for judgment of acquittal, setting aside the jury verdict, and for a new trial. And on February 17, 1982, Williams was sentenced to three years in prison and fined $50,000. Response of the Senate After several further delays, the Senate on March 3rd finally began debating whether to expel Harrison Williams. Majority Leader Howard Baker, Republican of Tennessee, explained that the body would follow procedures similar to those used in the past, with committees not allowed to meet for more than two hours after the Senate convened, no other business to be transacted, and a quorum of senators actually present in the chamber. Malcolm Wallop, Republican of Wyoming, and Howard Heflin, Democrat of Alabama, spoke for the Ethics Committee, and Daniel Inoue served as advocate for Williams. Heflin emphasized that the committee had operated in an entirely bipartisan manner and had reached a unanimous conclusion. He contended that information presented by newspaper columnist Jack Anderson in recent weeks, alleging wrongdoing by the FBI in the case, also should not affect the Senate's action. Regardless of what the FBI had done, Williams had clearly offered to use his influence as a senator and had conspired to keep his share in the venture secret. Harrison Williams also addressed the Senate at great length in his own behalf. Before he started, he offered to be placed under oath and to waive his immunity under the Speech and Debate Clause of the Constitution, Article 1, Section 6. But Senate leaders objected that there was no precedent for such action. This was not an evidentiary proceeding, and such a precedent could place pressure on senators in future cases to take similar oaths. Eventually, it was agreed that Williams would simply assure the Senate that he would not use immunity as a defense if he were ever charged with perjury for statements he made in his defense on the Senate floor. Declaring his complete innocence, Williams called the recommendation for expulsion preposterous. 
after describing at length how he became involved in the questionable venture. He focused on what he called the entrapment and misconduct by the government in the case. Inoue charged that in the past, expulsion from the Senate had been reserved for cases of treason. But committee member Thomas Eagleton, Democrat of Missouri, retorted, If non-treasonous behavior be the sole benchmark of fitness to serve in this body, then one must ask, how fit is this body in which we serve? Several senators, chief among them Alan Cranston, Democrat of California, suggested censure as a more appropriate sanction. While recognizing that Williams had acted in a manner unbecoming a senator, Cranston explained that censure, not being irrevocable like expulsion, was more appropriate while Williams was still pursuing his appeals. Later, if all the appeals were denied, the Senate could still decide to expel him. Wallop responded, pointing out that Williams had continued his involvement in the questionable enterprise over a period of many months, and that the performance of the FBI was not the question, but rather Williams' conduct. Eagleton then noted that just because Williams had not had the grace to withdraw from the Senate, we should not perpetrate our own disgrace by asking him to stay. When it became apparent that the censure movement lacked support and that the Senate would most likely vote for expulsion, Harrison Williams resigned from the Senate on March 11, 1982. Conclusion Harrison Williams served 21 months of his three-year prison sentence and was released on January 31, 1986. The Senate was careful to take no action against Williams until the legal process had run its course, in order not to prejudice the case. Once he had been convicted and sentenced, however, the body was prepared to move against him. Committee members made clear during the debate that even if Williams had not been convicted, the Senate would have had every right to conduct its own review of his behavior to determine whether he had violated any Senate rules. While Daniel Inouye was correct that the Senate had previously only expelled members for disloyalty, several senators involved in corruption cases either had resigned, like Williams, or had died before the Senate could vote on expulsion. End of Section 142, End of Case 140. Section 143 of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793-1990, to by Anne M. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Case 141, David F. Durenberger, 1934 to present, Minnesota. Censure Case, September 27, 1988, to July 25, 1990. Issues. Financial Misconduct Chronology Complaint Received September 27, 1988 Committee Report July 20, 1990 Senate Vote July 25, 1990 Result Censured or Denounced Background On September 27, 1988, the Select Committee on Ethics received a complaint from 39 members of the Minnesota Bar, charging financial improprieties by David F. Durenberger, Republican of Minnesota. At the time, the senator was in the midst of his third senatorial campaign. Statement of the Case The complaint alleged that a financial agreement between David Durenberger and Piranha Press, which had published his books, Neither Madmen Nor Messiahs, and Prescription for Change, violated laws and rules within the committee's jurisdiction. In fairness to Durenberger, the committee waited until after the election to look into the charges. 
Then, based on the initial evidence and a response it received from Durenberger, the committee voted unanimously on March 1, 1989, to proceed with a preliminary inquiry, the first stage of the Ethics Committee's three-stage process. The results of that inquiry led the committee on August 3rd to move to the second stage, an initial review, and to retain as special counsel Robert S. Bennett, who had served in that capacity during the 1981 Harrison-Williams investigation, see Case 140. In December 1989, during the course of the Piranha Press inquiry, Minnesota newspapers printed a number of allegations about David Durenberger's ownership and use of a Minneapolis condominium, which became the subject of a second inquiry. By May 1990, the committee had found sufficient evidence of misconduct in both instances to proceed to the third stage, a full investigation with trial-like public hearings. The committee held hearings on June 12th and 13th, 1990. In his opening statement, Durenberger spoke movingly of his personal history and problems. Then, at the close of the opening statements, the senator waived his due process rights provided by the committee, including the rights to cross-examine witnesses, call and question his own witnesses, and testify on his own behalf. Instead, he asked the committee to rely on the written record in reaching its decision. This action terminated hearings that had been expected to receive extensive media coverage. In the written record, the senator had defended himself by arguing that he had made mistakes, but that he had acted in good faith with no intention of violating any rules. The committee, however, rejected this defense based on the evidence collected by the special counsel. The committee unanimously agreed on July 18, 1990, that David Durenberger had abused his United States Senate office and misused United States Senate funds. In its report, issued two days later, the committee found that the senator's relationship with Piranha Press had been carefully structured to circumvent the limits on the amount of honoraria income a senator could receive. In 1985, David Durenberger had signed an agreement with the press to speak to more than 100 organizations to promote his books. Each group paid a fee to Piranha Press, which then paid Durenberger quarterly stipends for his efforts. At the time, ethics laws contained no limits on income from stipends, while there was a limit on the amount of honoraria that could be received from speaking engagements. During a two-year period, the senator received $100,000 in stipend payments for these supposedly promotional appearances. The committee concluded that the purpose of the arrangement was not to sell the books, but rather to allow Durenberger to deliver speeches to organizations that invited him because of his position as senator, not as author of the books, and to collect more payment than the law permitted. Regarding the second part of the inquiry, the report found that from 1984 to 1989, Durenberger had devised a complex series of transactions to obscure his ownership of the Minneapolis condominium he used on his visits there. The arrangement allowed him improperly to claim government reimbursement for rent paid. He charged the government a sufficiently high rate per day for the 100 days a year that he used the unit for business, that the reimbursements covered all his annual costs for the condominium. According to the committee report, such financial practices violated both Senate rules and governmental ethics. Other violations included 
failing to report on his financial disclosure forms reimbursement from 43 organizations for travel costs for Piranha Press and trips to Boston for personal business converting a $5,000 campaign contribution to personal use through a transfer to Piranha Press, and accepting free limousine services in Boston, thus breaking the Senate rule regulating acceptance of gifts from anyone with a direct interest in legislation before Congress. The committee did note that at the time of these actions, Durenberger had been under severe personal stress that had impaired his judgment, but that this fact did not excuse his conduct. The committee submitted to the Senate a resolution stating that Durenberger's conduct has been reprehensible and in violation of statutes, rules, and Senate standards and acceptable norms of ethical conduct. It recommended that he be denounced, and that he be required to reimburse the Senate for the per diem funds and to donate the excess honoraria income to charity. Before the final report was released, David Durenberger wrote to the committee asking that he be reprimanded rather than denounced by the full Senate. In support of his request, he cited his lack of malicious intent and the many measures he had taken to comply with ethics legislation and rules. This plea was denied, based on special counsel Robert Bennett's recommendation in his report to the committee. In the 1981 case of Harrison Williams, Bennett declared, he had supported expulsion because the New Jersey senator had acted with criminal intent. Durenberger, he believed, had not. On the other hand, he contended that a reprimand or other sanction, not requiring action by the full Senate, would be insufficient, because Durenberger had behaved unethically by knowingly and willfully violating laws, rules, and Senate standards. The report also recommended that the investigation's results be referred to the Federal Election Commission and the Department of Justice. Response of the Senate On July 25, 1990, the full Senate considered the committee's resolution. Because David Durenberger unexpectedly informed his colleagues at the beginning of the session that he would not contest the resolution of censure, much of the debate addressed concerns about the disciplinary process and the role of the special counsel. Howell Heflin, Democrat of Alabama, chairman of the Ethics Committee, emphasized the bipartisan nature of the committee's deliberations and outlined the reasons for the panel's recommendations. He did express concern about the committee's role as prosecutor, judge, and jury. For future investigations, he suggested that the Senate might adopt a procedure similar to one that had been recently enacted by the House of Representatives, which divided the investigative and adjudicative functions into two separate subcommittees. One panel could then function as a grand jury and the other as a trial jury. While agreeing that the committee's work had not been partisan, Trent Lott, Republican of Mississippi, a committee member, urged that the investigative process be improved. The multiplicity of stages caused a case to drag on, in this instance for almost two years. Meanwhile, the accused individual remained under a cloud. Lott recommended streamlining the procedure by eliminating some of the stages. Committee Chairman Heflin, however, explained that the multi-stage process was actually designed to protect the individual being investigated. Under the committee's rules, the two early portions of an inquiry were carried out in closed session, and only the third stage, the formal investigation and hearing, 
was conducted in public. In fact, on a number of occasions, he declared, the confidentiality of the procedure had protected senators against whom unjust charges had been brought with the committee. Heflin also defended the special counsel's work as following the rules established by the committee. The debate also reflected continuing uncertainty over the terms used in disciplining members. Trent Lott addressed the choice of denouncement rather than censure. Past cases, he said, showed different levels of punishment. Thus, there could be denouncement, condemnation, censure, and expulsion by the full Senate. He indicated that the committee had chosen denouncement in order to distinguish Durenbergers from previous cases because of the mitigating circumstances and lack of venal intent. When Howell Heflin was questioned about the term, however, he responded that it fell within the parameters of censure. The differences in terminology could be subject to individual interpretation, he explained, but the point was that the Senate as a whole acts to show its displeasure, its disapproval, in strong language. A number of senators praised David Durenberger's hard work and legislative accomplishments, and reaffirmed their friendship and sympathy for him while accepting the committee's decision. At the conclusion of the debate, the Senate passed the resolution denouncing Durenberger by a vote of 96 to 0. After the vote, David Durenberger addressed the Senate, stating, For past mistakes, I ask your forgiveness. For future challenges, I need your friendship. Conclusion The Senate action to denounce David Durenberger did not end his difficulties. On April 20, 1993, the senator was indicted and pleaded not guilty to two felony charges related to filing false claims for reimbursement. A federal judge dismissed the indictment in December 1993 basing his ruling on the Speech and Debate Clause of the Constitution, Article 1, Section 6, that protects senators from prosecution for actions taken in their official capacities. The Senate had submitted a brief to the court in support of Durenberger's argument that the courts could not use affidavits from third parties that he had submitted to the Ethics Committee. The judge, however, observed that the case could probably be made without using the inadmissible evidence, and a grand jury reindicted the senator on the same charges on February 25, 1994. In February 1995, the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia ruled that Durenberger could not use the constitutional protection because he was charged with lying about his condominium on his disclosure form. In the midst of these legal problems, Durenberger announced on September 16, 1993, that he would not seek re-election in 1994. In 1991, as part of further changes in ethics provisions, Congress banned the acceptance of honoraria, as well as of stipends related to official position or duties. The debate in this case reflected the Senate's continuing discomfort with a process that is part investigatory and part adjudicatory, as well as with the expanded role of the special counsel. The Durenberger case also identifies some emerging issues in misconduct cases legal costs for both the committee and senators being investigated have increased substantially. These costs were apparently an important factor in Durenberger's decision to waive his due process rights in the committee hearing. As the number of statutes regulating congressional behavior has increased, 
so has the role of executive branch agencies, such as the Justice Department, in providing oversight and prosecution of members. If this trend continues, senators charged with misconduct may increasingly face indictments after the Senate completes its internal disciplinary action. End of Case 141 of Section 143 and End of United States Senate Election Expulsion and Censure Cases, 1793-1990 by Ann M. Butler.